Bid on fifteen. Let's get ready to mumble. We're going to have some amazing poetry here in a minute. If anyone wants to sign up on the open mic, let us know. Share your truth. That's, yes, and then depending on the evening, we've had nights where we've had 40 or 50 people, and it just had to be one poem, and then we've had some other nights where we were all able to express a little bit more, so 
Is here for the poetry? Yes, come on in. There is a restroom in the back, and I think there might be someone in there. But yep, yeah, all the way in the back. You're welcome. Let me know if you need cups or anything. Okay, I got you. It's great to meet you. Oh, yes. Every third Saturday. Every second Saturday. Every second Saturday of the month. Go down with some great poetry. Yeah. Yeah. It is the same. Open mic. Come in. If you want to share a poem, boy, we'd love to hear it. Absolutely. We're going to get started on that in a little bit. We're lucky to have an amazing teacher this evening, and then we'll get to. Um, that will not ban.
Oh, did you hear that fade out, folks? It must be time for kindred creatives, kindred voices, kindred spirits. We do a poetry open mic every second Saturday of the month. So here we are this evening, an amazing feature, amazing open mic poets. There's still time to get on. My name's Paul. I'm the co-host. That's Reverie. She's your main host. That's Cicely. We're only here thanks to Cicely, everybody. Hey, clap, finger snaps. Come live with me and be my love, and we will all the pleasures prove. Where else the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man, down to a sun-soaked sea. Because we're here tonight for love, so let's break the ice in that regard and welcome up our feature. Christopher Stephen Soden received his MFA in poetry from Vermont College of the Fine Arts. He teaches craft, theory, genre, and literature. He writes poetry, plays, film, and theater critique for sharpcritic.com. Christopher's poetry collection, Closer, was released in June 2011. He received a fellowship to Lambda Literary Retreat for Emerging LGBT Voices in August. Honors include Distinguished Poets of Dallas, Founding Member, President, and President Emeritus of the Dallas Poets Community. His work has appeared in Rattle, <laughs> The Corlin Review. I need some oxygen. This man is amazing. Welcome up to the mic, Christopher Soto. Okay. Thank you very much, Paul. All right. Good evening, everyone. It's very nice to, it's a pleasure to meet you. It's a splendid evening, isn't it? I'm gonna try not to wreck that for you. Um, okay, I'm gonna start out with this one. I actually, I met this guy at Vermont College. Um, he's a straight guy and I fell in love with him and this was a really bad mistake. <laughs> uh, this was really ill-advised. So why don't we start with this one? And it's called The Curveball of Silent Beauty. I could describe the color of his hair, his eyes, if I could remember. His pale skin, his diminutive height, but no, 
for me his anger is remarkable. The quiet, seething, tangible, and canny as bubbling pitch. A double shot of Jägermeister. A blackout from an August heat wave. He befriended his rage and never left his side. The charisma of his shadow was intoxicating. Everyone said he was bad news. His friends did. I told God I didn't care. I believed we shared a primitive connection. I jerked off over him three times. It was quick, vivid, intuitive, gorgeous. A blind fever cracking my skull. There was no life after that. Just fierce, jangle jungle, goblin sleep, clarity, simple, quiet pleasure of amaretto, a sophisticated film, a rich bite of crab cake. Our last residency, he was actually magnanimous. He hugged me more than once. Front row for my lecture, my reading. Met my mother at graduation. Took a picture together, just he and I. Scalding tears on the flight back, we could talk about the violent ride of misunderstanding. We could talk about the violent ride of misunderstanding, delusion, the beating, waiting behind the unspoken. I never heard anything back, not a single word. I am the prince of ridiculous, the sworn enemy of reason, the pathetic monkey of cannibal dads. It's okay to laugh now. I would. Thank you. You know, I did forget to mention something. I am going to dedicate this reading to my mama, Betty. It's been a little over seven years. Uh, my mama, she's a ringtail tutor. She's beautiful, she's intelligent, She's sharp, she's got a wicked sense of humor, and I fucking miss her. <laughs> I shouldn't have said it like that. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. <laughs> but Mama, this is for you. Okay, let's do cocktail. Cocktail. An abscess sprouted the back of my thigh where I couldn't see. So the doctor put me on strong antibiotics. So loopy, I lost track of my psychotropic, leaving Jack in the box with Chloe on my lap. I felt a flood wash through my brain as if the earth could no longer tolerate my presence. I had to snap off the radio and pull over, scalding salt brimming. Black cyclone gulping me straight to its maw. There's nothing cozier than the cocktail Janice and I have found together through the months, the seasons. One combination after another juggling and spinning and balancing till precision emerged. I have learned to 
to appreciate the ritual of the small red box with its seven hatches, counting one or two per day, blue or yellow or orange, tiny writing, score, saving capsules for the lab. It's not about a cure. It's finally knowing you can manage. It's embracing the revelation that a small prescription bottle rolling under the sofa could send you spinning. I no longer fear addiction. I have discovered the grace of quantifiable comfort. I take my miracle where I can find it. I, uh, I wrote this poem about a woman I have always admired, and uh, I've always felt like she really, really was never appreciated for who she truly was. Um, the, the title of this poem is Good Night, Honey. She wasn't crazy about the insipid platinum blondes she was asked to play, soft buffoons, a goddess too merciful to see she could turn them to ashes, or orangutan with a murmured spell. Her last film was The Misfits, written by her husband, a woman in pigtails and jeans. Frank and naive, blind to the effect she has on cowboys as lost as she. She finds them trapping defiant Mustangs and fights them off before they can break another soul. In the seven year itch, she straddles in a subway grate, steam lifting her skirt like the hot breath of a minotaur or drooling neighbor. In Some Like It Hot, she plays ukulele in a woman's band, crossing paths with two musicians disguised as ladies. She's done with guys who squander her money on the ponies and the other girls. Sleeping that first night on the train, the bass player climbs into the upper bunk. Drunk on enchantment, he wishes her good night. Good night, honey, she replies, in that whispery way, softer than moonlight. For that moment, this orphan of the world splurged without caution, warmth impossible to find. In that astonishing instant, gone before we know, genuine care brushes our cheek, but lingers. I'm, I'm, I'll start this one with just a brief, um, just a brief anecdote. Um, in, around Christmas time, in the '70s, we went to visit my grandma, who lives in who lived in Houston, and we all went to see um, a movie, which was called Nicholas and Alexandria, and it was about the last Tsar of Russia, of course. 
and his wife and his children. It was my mom and my dad um, and my two older sisters and myself. I'm the baby of the family. So there we were in Houston and it was Christmas time and we decided we were gonna go and see this film, Nicholas and Alexandria. We drove to Houston to spend the holiday with my dad's mom. I was 13, the two older sisters. We agreed on a movie. It was Christmas, 1971, and rainy. Cars splashing through black, slick streets. Whatever your politics, the spectacle of dying Russian aristocracy was a marvel. The opulent gowns and somber, sophisticated tuxedos, enough servants to make a shtetl, chaotic cosmos swirling in counterpoint to their masters, never colliding. My sisters, Victoria and Penelope complimented and tortured one another. Vicky, calm and composed. Penny, the frail yet fearless princess of Sturm und Drang. We were a melange of intellect, conviviality, and venom, despite our appreciation for the savior in the manger. Maybe you know the rest. The child prince bleeding from delicate contusions and Rasputin, flagrant monastic zealot, the only one who could heal him. When the Romanovs, Tsar and Tsarina, four princesses and gentle Alexei were ushered to the basement, spell holding, Till it was too late to beg. None of us were surprised. I think it was me who noticed first the sobbing that came from Penelope, dragged to a film with an ending she couldn't foresee. Our clumsy attempts to comfort her were pointless, lost in despair unable to explain when she asked, why didn't you say something? <laughs> How could we tell her their violent swim to the realm of nightmares was a foregone conclusion? I felt so bad for Penelope. <laughs> she was just crying and crying. I said, I'm sorry. I just... We all thought she did. <laughs> okay. Now, a lot of you might not guess this, but at the tender age of eight o'clock, I was a fierce rebel at Rosemont Elementary School in 1966. So here are the details. Iconoclast. It was 1966. I was in third grade. And remember how pretty our teacher was. And though I had a crush, didn't grasp the consequence. I'd seen the new wave and liked the hair, so I let it grow, unaware it would cause such an uproar. Mrs. Henry quoted the Bible, does it My exquisite teacher sent me to the office with a message bobby pin in my hair. And the relentless interrogation from my peers. Anarchy was lost on me. Enchanted kid, impervious to ignorant tormentor. There was a beguiling older boy named Chris, top of the totem. I'd watch him sailing between classes as if some dangerous god were nudging. 
he was 12, so tall his head with brushed gentle congenial clouds, forced jet plane to turn back. I happened to pass him, ducking in his locker, girlfriend by his side. Slowly, a grin stretched across his face, like a crisp white snake. He walked up and tousled. His girl smiling too. Look, Chris, it's just like yours. A gush of bliss shot through me like rockets. Very cool, buddy, he said. And instantly, the cyclone I'd set in motion was revealed as an oracle, and the shiny penny dropped. I'm going to do two more thank you. Um, let me tell you, he was so fun. <laughs> oh my God. I was ready to pass out. Um, probably the only thing you need to know about this one, I was, I was leaving an artist colony in Vermont, and this was the very first time I ever, I ever ate pad thai. I had it brought to my hotel room, and I'd never had it before. And it, this one is called pad thai. I wasn't happy to leave the comforting arms of photographers and sculptors and painters and potters and playwrights and novelists and poets I found at the artist colony in Vermont. But my excursion was done and a plane waiting to gulp me the next day and return to Texas. So I checked into a motel in Burlington. No elevator, no room service. I'd ordered something from Jay Lee I'd never heard of. I made the trek for ice and pop, climbing the weary stairs to the room that was only mine and undressed. I discovered a documentary flamboyant with details of Harrison, Lennon, McCartney, and Starr. It was November and I parted the orange curtains, somber with the vexation between Texas and anything enchanted and careless as snow. Was it a young, sweet lad who rapped shyly at my door? Jazzed by my chipper messenger, fetching as Hermes, I opened my styrofoam cask of wonders, delivered the strange concoction to my mouth, closing my eyes to get the full effect. Ecstatic waves suffused my blood, forehead to heel, palm to shoulder, mansat to ass. Sitar music unwound like radio transmission from another galaxy, drizzling, sticky bliss in my ear. I once met a boy, or should I say, he once met me. And then, without notice, impossible tavern, weightless as prayer, drifted to in that moment of improbable intersection, the earth was a glad and welcoming home, bubbling me in miracles within me.
it doesn't matter how many poems you bring, you're always changing your mind. <laughs> it's here, I know it's here. <laughs> okay, I wanna thank you guys. I wanna thank you guys for coming. And I wanna thank Cicely, and I wanna thank, thank Reverie, and I wanna thank Paul. Thank you so much. This last one is called Swaddling. When you put on your coat and light a smoke on the front stoop, December gusts tear into you. But that drag rides all the way down as you shut your lid. A hat like your dad wore when you thrummed his bass at the clubs, skitters down the street, no one to chase and bring it back. For the first time, you notice a distant train bellowing like a bull past consolation. A man in his 20s wanders under a street lamp, snuffling now unmistakable. You offer your handkerchief, but the wind is against you. The night enfolds him like an endless black curtain. You barely make out the whimper. You follow for blocks until you find a spaniel to afflict it stand. Why is tonight different? Saturday or Wednesday, you'd have returned home. But now, at 10.37, something rough and painful bruises your chest. You remove your and wrap him delicately, singing in a whisper. You bend to kiss his sloppy snout. Now something that turns your bone to life. Thank you. Was Tennessee Williams here this evening? No, I think I'm mistaken. We were luckier than that. Christopher Steven Soden, everybody! Thank you, Christopher. He can be found at sharpcritic.com? Sharpcritic.com. Sharpcritic.com. Okay, the master of ceremonies, the boss of bosses, my boss every day, Reverie came up with an idea by which we like to kind of the motto of our open mic, meet me with curiosity. So as I call out the names, come on up, do a poem or two for us, keep it at about five minutes. But as both poet, artist, and as audience, let's meet each other with love, kindness, acceptance, and curiosity. And with that in mind, our first open mic artist, welcome to the stage, Crystal. Hi. Hi. So I am here visiting from South Florida. And I, whenever I travel, I typically look for open mic sessions. And I'm so glad that you guys are doing this here and allowing a space for people to speak. I was really inspired by your dedication to your mother, so I want to share a poem that I wrote about my mom who passed away a couple of months ago. It's called Lost. I got a little lost when I lost my mom. It was like a bomb went off, a flash of her life, repeated over and over in my head. The moments, those precious moments, I can never relive but hold on to so tightly. Even then, a rush of what ifs and remorses. Did I fail her as a daughter? Did she treat
little know how deeply I love her. Oh, how I wish that I could just hold her to look into her eyes once more. My mother, who birthed me, body to body, my heartbeat began in hers, the miracle of life given to me, and my connection to everything. But now she's gone. No more divinity or eternity. Life just ends that quickly. All that's left is memories. It's very scary and dark. I wish I could see the light. It's all moving wonder. What is the point? What is our purpose? Am I even doing life right? I try to suppress my tears by holding my eyelids sealed with a fingertip death grip. I hold them in, not a single tear shed, for a moment, until I finally let go and I lose control. Underneath my eyelids lay a feeling, a small body of water that only flows, a river running off my face that drowns everything near. I try to wipe it away, but nothing can absorb that kind of pain. Will I ever regain, regain feeling sane? Yeah. I got a little lost when I lost my mom. Mm. I want to share another one, though, because even though that was very dark, um, I have found a new perspective, and I'm always trying to uplift others despite dark situations. So this one is called Standing Tall. Poetically poisoned by the pain of my past, protective of the passion that lasts through disaster a mass. Perseverance perpetuating, alas, a final grasp to overcome and last through defeat. I won't be beaten. I found reprieve in the concrete, the hope that's so divine and supreme, even in the darkness, a full being of life finds its way into my dreams. There's no way I'll leave. I'll find a place to be, achieve, and always see. The way out, the way through, the way around. Even underground, I'll dig my way back up and fight. But do not fear me. I wish to stand tall with you, with anyone, especially those who think they're too small. Earthly fall, the call is far too strong to keep us separated because we are endangered. The power sits in the hands of a stranger, one who feels and sees the connection and does it indeed. Those who drive to help themselves and all the others, we single-handedly mold the future, a better tomorrow, a place that we instill how important it is to not suffer in silence, but rather free will, the power to rise. Our own struggles revive us and keep us grounded. I am surrounded by the reminder of the fire that lives within me and within all of us. Yeah. Crystal, everybody. <laughs> Helping us believe in Florida again. She's <laughs> yeah. um, asking a lot, but her poem's really good. <laughs> I'm going to take off my host hat here for a second because polls up next time the open mic. Maybe one to awe and maybe one to laugh at. You know, love poems. Here's the first one dedicated to my life right here. My lips are blue corn and honey is jealous. A wild wind rages behind my ribs. Great lovers wait in the cellar of my stare. Galaxies begin at the tips of my fingers. They refuse to identify themselves. I looked at her and said, I love you. They told me they were sure there is no meaning to any of this. I looked at her and said, I love you. Leaning on the back of the couch, I tipped the world and every world in each dimension knew. I looked at her. And now for that, oh, get out of here. 
summer by the pool. It was late and your knock was unexpected. I answered holding my dad's Leica in one hand and a half gone bottle of Frosty Spumante in the other. Lucky for me, the camera was home and my parents weren't. <laughs> you wanted to come in and show me your new bikini from anklet to appendix scar on the sh shutter clicked. You kissed me whispering, the hand's a trembler when the heart's a fool. My last butterfly dissolved like sugar and sugar stirred by the spoon of your ass. Common sense waited at the window sill like a lark or a nipple waiting to be bitten. Inside, I felt like a movie werewolf and I called for a priest when the steam from the hot tub mentioned that the night was a dark and hairless arm shot full of silver. And you taught me that the mound is an entrance and a beginning and tutored me in the subtle difference between the inside and the outside touch. And I thought about running away or renting a velvet tuxedo and matching limousine or rolling back on top when my tongue told me that your uvula was the last honest man in the room. So I broke the in case of emergency glass and the note inside read, skinny dipping should only be used as a last resort. <laughs> Next, look out Valentine's. Up to the stage, Jado! Have we run you out yet? It's your turn. <laughs> this is what we call an entrance. Sorry, I got a call from my two-year-old. <laughs> My name is Jada. I'm currently an art teacher here in Dallas. Um, a little bit about me, I was homeless my junior and senior year of high school, so I've kind of had to overcome some things, and this book was actually my first book. Not like off of Mean Girls. It was mostly about me. I intended to write it and then burn it, but somebody told me to publish it, so here it is. <laughs> Still toed boots. Day after day, dust to dawn, the boots are stationed by the door. Having left at 5 a.m. and returning after dark, they steadily burnish in the corner. The boots are withered and worn, discolored and damaged beyond repair. There was a time in which they glittered like gold. They were well crafted. The thread was perfectly stitched, a combination of brown, black, and caramel, intertwined venously. The boots were resistant, durable, and crafted to conquer anything. But by now, they've had their fair share of obstacles. <clears throat> they once were magical, but neither were the same at this point. They were conflicted, torn between the two. They lost their shine. The souls of each were, the souls of each were hanging on for dear life. If the wind whistled one day, each soul would blow away. Having only the support of the wall, the boots reached in the corner. Light from the window drifted in to complement the boots' imperfection. The soul-seeking tongue of the boots reminisced on the good old days, just as they were snatched and worn for another workday. They trampled through rubble, dirt, and nails, and still they carry on. They work to support both themselves and their owner, even while bleeding and crying out for help. Despite their condition, he continues to wear them, day in and day out, having no empathy or remorse for the fact that he's tired, he is broken. He will disregard that she has been his support even when he had no one else. He could care less that he's nothing without her, even while tears are pouring down her face and her fragile heart continuously breaks. He will not stop to comfort her. He will carry on. There was a time in which they shared the same room, the same bed, and the same space. Now he leaves her at the front door, stationed there, without the least bit of affection. Intimacy comes only when he needs something, and she'll be so naive to think that maybe he does care, maybe he does love me. That will be the spark that she needs to endure one more day. 
but when the weather's bad and the rain begins to fill the well of her eyes, she will think back to better days, days when she was beautiful and full of life. How did she come this far? Or did that even matter? Why was she still here? She knows that he's aware of the damage that he's caused, and it will not keep him from pushing the knife even further into her heart. Just when she feels the heat arise, he will simply throw her away and buy a brand new pair of boots, boots that are newer, brighter, more durable than she could ever be, leaving her in such condition that only a desperate man would be willing to take her, a man who had limited options one who just needed another pair of boots to get him by. Well, that is until he too could do better. And along with your help, we will repeat the same cycle as before. Having known her past trauma will not change his purpose for her, nor will it distract him from his overall goal of self-improvement. He will take advantage of every opportunity and he will do so without any empathy or regard for the fact that she, that you, are not a pair of boots. Mm -hmm. um, this second one I wrote, it was in, uh, it was around the time, so I come from a town called Lubbock, Texas. Um, most people know it because of Texas Tech. And regardless of how much we've advanced, it is still a very prejudiced town. Um, I lived in East Lubbock and there's only black people in East Lubbock. And then the rest of the town past Texas Tech is, of course, white. So um, this uh, poem is a reflection of that, um, that environment that I grew up in. It's called Over the Hills. Over the hills, it's lighter, brighter. The sun always shines there. There's clear skies, clean streets, and shiny cars there. And the people are one of a kind there. They're all tall, noses in the air with nice houses and fat bank accounts. Over the hills, it's lighter, brighter. The sun always shines there. There's no crime or mischief or thieves there. There's no abandoned buildings, welfare offices, or shelters there. The grass is green there, the trees are all tall, and the children are all saints there. Oh, and before I forget, everybody's lawn is mowed there. <laughs> the landscapes in their front yards are phenomenal. There's pools in their backyards, and every yard has a fence there. Over the hills, it's lighter, brighter, and the sun always shines there. There's new developments every day, more restaurants than you can imagine. Spas, shopping malls, and game rooms are all there. There's a United, <coughs> excuse me, there's a United, Walmart, H-E-B, and Food King there. Oh yeah, and I almost forgot, they have dessert places there, mm -hmm. like Smoothie King, Insomnia Cookie, High Bar, by far, that's my favorite. <clears throat> and Brahms, they even have a Brahms there. There are like 50 clinics and they even have an animal clinic there. There's car, there's car lots, party rooms, companies and firms out there, and there's over 20 schools there. Over the hills, they have enough money to feed every hungry child here. Yet on my side of the hills, the hills cast, the hills cast shadows here. The hills block out sun and cause droughts and discomfort here. The grass isn't green here. The streets aren't clean here. Yards are polluted and fences are rare here. Gunshots are loud here. Buildings are abandoned, are abandoned, which provides a place for drug addicts to lay their heads and little girls to get raped here. There are bingo halls, gang rooms, and liquor stores on almost every corner here, which keeps the poor poor here. There are like six restaurants, two clinics, and maybe four schools here. Community leaders pick up trash and mow grass here. Mothers, fathers, they parent lost and misguided souls here. Teachers provide shelters and love for children here. Elderly aid wounds because no one can afford health insurance here. Single mothers team up to be supporters, doctors, counselors, and coaches to children here because if we don't look out for one another, no one will look out for us here. On my side of the hill, those people that claim to be for us, we never see here. And even though they claim to be from here, they no longer live here. 
They moved over the hills and disregard what it's like to live here. Over the hills, they say that we have the same opportunity. But tell that to the kids that grow up fast here. Single mothers who work two jobs to provide for their children. Little girls who sell their bodies to provide food for their younger siblings here. Tell that to the kids who are faced with their reality every single day here. And when you look outside and you see the life that you created for your children, remember, we didn't get that same opportunity here. We were taught to survive here. We were taught to love and look out for one another. We were taught to dream, although our parents can't afford college here. We were taught to bottle up trauma because there's way too much work to be done here. And there's no time to waste here. We were taught to value ourselves, although those over the hills look down on us here. They say that we'll never amount to anything here. They say that we are nothing more than criminals and thieves here. They say that the conditions on our side of town are sufficient enough here. They protest over the hills about injustices all over the world without, without acknowledging the injustice here. Over the hills, they say that it's a part of life. Everyone has obstacles to overcome. But until you've lived here, survived the circumstances here, you'll never be able to understand here. And of my 23 years of living, 24 now, nothing much has changed here. I know, over the, I know the hills are to blame because they allow you to ignore what really goes on here. They allow you to blindly stereotype us while you raise your children as if the world treats us fair here. And I know, you donate to the hungry kids in Africa, but when will you open your eyes and realize that you're needed here? And I know there's hills all over the world, but please, open your eyes. There are no hills here. Rita, there was a reason you didn't burn those pages so that your words could continue to always burn in our hearts and ears. One more time, everybody. <laughs> Next up, my new best friend. I'm not jealous. Her glasses are cooler than mine. Welcome up, Lynn. <laughs> for the first one. I promise to bring you up for the second one. Um, this one is called Definitions. And as a preface, there's a leader named Benjamin Disraeli who's credited with saying, never apologize for showing feeling because when you do so, you apologize for truth. So with that, this one. You are intriguing, he said. Someday, I'd love to make you French toast and give you a key to my apartment. He wants to be my Mr. Right. The right swipe leads to dinner, to him saying all the right things, which leads right to his place, which leads to a right hook, my face, a flash, shock, blood, eyes wide in disbelief. This can't be happening. This, this is happening. No, no, it's a complete sentence, completely ignored. More blows, I don't know how to fight. He's stronger, he's on top. Everything a blur and slow motion all at once. Think, calculate the odds, run the scenarios, how to get out with the least damage. Play possum, wait it out, close your eyes, survive, gather your things. Drive yourself home. Cry. Later they'll ask him, why did you rape her? I didn't. She let me. Sure, because you hit her. That's why she let you. And it dwindled away into definitions. Get it together, girl. That was yesterday. Today is a new day. You have to feel your feelings. Unless they are terribly unpleasant, in which case you should numb them as quickly and as thoroughly as possible by whatever means necessary. 
busyness, booze, shopping, scrolling, music, gaming, food, weed, sex. Try looking for happiness in all the places you lost it. You have to feel your feelings, but only for an appropriately short moment. Then dust it off. Get some concealer, slather on the arnica. Stop crying in conference calls, for God's sake. Will taking the day off from work really make it any better? Sure, those bruises are gnarly. You can still dial a phone, you can still type emails. Feel your feelings. But girl, what are you doing on the bathroom floor? That wailing, that gasping, that guttural sound coming out of your chest, it's god awful, it's too much. Get a grip. Who even are you? I don't recognize you, you don't recognize you. Empty shell of yourself, a dirty towel tossed in the corner, writhing, broken. Beware and be aware. The stories we tell ourselves to try and make sense of it. Everything happens for a reason. All things work together for good. Talk less, smile more. These are the platitudes that cannot reach the bathroom floor. I am homesick for a version of myself that no longer exists. Where from here? Unclear, but with all my being, I do know not this, not this. What more is there to say? No is a complete sentence. little bit. This next one is just a short one that I wrote as a teenager, shiny and new, and it has stayed with me ever since. It's the only poem I still have memorized along with Cherish by Kayla McGann from 1984, but that's another story. <laughs> it's called The Dance. It floats near and is gone. I long to hold the dance so free and strong. I am the wildest of birds, the quickest of fairies, rippling like still water held in my hands. And then the music ends. Thank you, guys. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you, thank you very much. Sometimes this world is a heavy place. Who better to help us lift that for a minute than welcome to the stage, Atlas. Uh, the short one and the longer one. First one sort of inspired by the mom. First they came to the bookstores. <clears throat> And I did not speak out because I saw reading as a trivial task. Then they came to the toy stores and I did not speak out because I had already allowed my inner child to die. Mm -hmm. Then they came to the hobby and art supply stores and I did not speak out because I had already given up on all my creative endeavors. What was the point of making something new in a world that seemed to make it void? Then they came to the music and movie stores and I did not speak out because I was downloading the content for free, not paying. Then they came to the restaurants and I did not speak out because I heard about it while sitting alone in my home, eating a microwave meal. Then they came to the health and nutrition stores and I did not speak out. Honestly, I was too weak to put up a fight. Then they came to the home decor stores and I did not speak out. Because no one ever came to my house and I was never welcomed at anyone else's. Then they came to the rest of the brick and mortar stores, and I did not speak out because I was patiently waiting for my online order to be shipped to my door. And then they came for me, my job, my business, my livelihood, and there was no one left to speak for me. And there was no way for me to share my voice because by that point, they already controlled all people. Second one, <clears throat> you ever come across somebody who has like a weird tattoo and you're like, so you just act, act, have an, like an explanation for it and they just act like, well, it's in this you know, very exotic language. Like, oh, you speak that language? No, I just know that this word is supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> so I have this tattoo that says someone else and for a lot of people, it's just a funny gag, right? It's like, oh, I have a tattoo of someone's name. Oh, is it your mom? No, someone else. Oh, is it an ex? No, someone else. Hi. So someone else, and I'll explain, <laughs> I'll explain to all of you why I have this tattoo in the first place. Have you ever wanted to be someone else? Someone taller, thinner, wealthier, more influential, or in my case, I don't know, cooler? 
But the problem is, life has conditioned us as children all the way up to be yourself. It's the kind of thing that fills posters at work and coffee table quote books found you know, in anyone's living room and a convenient gift for less than $15 to someone who means enough, but not enough. <laughs> Oddly enough, people are always inspiring or attempting to inspire me to be myself during the times where I really don't like being myself. There are promises I break mostly to myself, lies I tell mostly to myself. I don't always like me, and there's a long list of exes who apparently did not like me either. I know, <laughs> hard to believe. But then I thought, okay, well, what do people like? What could I possibly emulate that would make me more liked by others? And it turns out we are obsessed with superheroes, right? Even during the height of the pandemic and quarantine, not one, not two, but three movies in theaters about a superhero, someone coming through to save the day, superior speed or strength. Strength is preferable, super cool, because none of us can do that. And we look at that and we say to ourselves, wow, that's incredible. Oddly enough, we are tuning in, we are binging watching not one, not two, but three, but four years worth of programming in a world filled with calamity. Everyone's wearing masks, everyone's dying. But where are the heroes? And so you might think, much like I did, when, how, how can any one of us do anything for anyone else that would save a life that would rescue an individual and then I thought man I actually see it pretty much every day imagine it's 8 55 in the morning and you work a nine to five job on this particular morning you are going to get a very condescending email from your boss if you show up late so on this particular morning you're rushing through but unfortunately not for you but the driver in front of you they hit some road debris and boom tire explodes they're sent veering into the concrete barricade. They're stopped. You're frozen. Now the first thing you should be thinking to yourself is I should probably pull over, I should see if they're okay. But then this other thing comes through called the bystander effect and you say to yourself, well, I did some quick math and it turns out I'm one of nine different drivers, all within the same proximity. I'm sure someone else will call for help. I'm sure someone else will stop and see what's going on. I'm sure even though that person in the car is extremely disoriented, they've got a cell phone, who doesn't? I mean, come on. They probably called for someone else to come. Look, I have things to do, okay, to fulfill responsibilities. I have to fulfill, and so you drive away. That's not the sad part. The sad part is that the eight other people looked at you and thought the same thing mm. and left. And whether you drive or not, we are all in some way especially as a result of March 2020, stranded. We are disoriented, we're confused, we feel alone. To save a life, you don't need flight or strength or superior speed to save a life. You need only what you have currently, time, a means of communicating to someone. It's my personal belief that COVID killed so many people once they were hospitalized, not because of the potency of the virus, but because of what loneliness did to the person's spirit. Imagine trying to fight a war when you haven't seen an ally in days, in weeks, and we're always waiting for someone else. In our relationships, we say, if I was with someone else, I would be loved and appreciated. In our careers, we say, if I worked for someone else, I'd be properly compensated and acknowledged, and politically, just check off a few names on the ballot we say I'm sure someone else will fix what is broken I'm sure someone else will make right what's been wrong for so long we're always looking for change to happen outside of us when we know damn well the only change that matters is the change that happens inside of us the world is in desperate need of someone else that someone else is me someone else is you. You're better. And if you have a hard time in this world, please come.
someone else, for someone else, and you'll find the next day for you. Look at these that we got here. Thank you. Wow. Alright, Linda did y'all talk before this started about how you were going to make me cry? Because, <laughs> damn. Alright, Lewis, well, suddenly, the center of the poetry universe. Goodness gracious. Unless anyone else wants to get up on the, on the list, to get up on the mic, we'd love to have you, the man that's going to bring it home. Welcome to the stage, Mohammed! Woo! Um, yeah, first things first, I don't do poetry, I don't do stand up. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, yes. Some common ground. Um, how long have you been having this poetry night? Since July. Six, Six months? Six months. Mm -hmm. Six months. Pretty good turnout. Okay, so. Okay, y'all ever hate on something for so long you started to like it? <laughs> you know, cause there was a point in time I'd rather slim my eyes and look at a pair of checkerboard vans. <laughs> and as I got older, I realized. You know how they call them chess board vans, I would have seemed to appeal sooner. <laughs> and the people at Vans, you know, think the general public are stupid. You know what they must not know? Their target audience has a chess not checkers mentality. In other words, you target the pretentious, because only some pompous piece of shit thinks that life's about Bishop, Knight, Rook, when it's just miniature hopscotch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people, you know, people in life like search for guidance, you know, they yearn for it. Some turn to drinking, others to religion. You know, I found lots of guidance through Bugs Bunny. You know, so irreverent, talk shit, gets away with everything. You know, like there was a time, you know, I had to decide between Fried Calamari and Dr. Pepper. And I know you're thinking, oh, Fried Calamari, no question. You know, but let me tell you something about Fried Calamari. You know, the special, believe me. You know, it's been an aquatic onion ring. It's a long out of Popeye's menu. And Dr. Pepper ain't fooling nobody. Just a tangy Coke. <laughs> Maybe a cinnamon Pepsi at best, but at any rate, you know, decisions gotta be made, so you gotta get my carrot cake and coffee going. And a couple slices in, and I room appetite. That's the pronounced wisdom of the Bugs Bunny technique. It's a foghorn leghorn when you hit fans in the air for so. You know, people will be saying anything. Why can't they start saying everything? Mm. Now this part I write, people just shut, shut up. People just shut, shut, shut up. Okay. This is different without a mic. <laughs> yeah, you know, but people do be saying anything, you know, saying things like it's a man's world. Dude, it's a man's world, my ass. <laughs> and if it was, we'd have titties printed on dollar bills. <laughs> <laughs> Pennies taped on his nipples. You know, not only does it make for good soft porn, it really pushes forward the free the nipple agenda. <laughs> Texas is too conservative. You know, maybe, you know, if we didn't promote everything that's bigger in Texas, we'd have more breathing room in that department. <laughs> like those cities in the Gulf of Mexico. You know, the fuck is going on with those horrific looking palm trees? Looking like Scooby Doo Zombie Island. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, racism. Yeah, that's right, racism. With a Z, you know, which we apply to with such ignorance, you know, so deep rooted in our psyche. We even began to discriminate against the opposite. You know, because pushing P has more privilege than the push of T is ever gonna have. <laughs> you know, you can be some, you can, you can be some cold brew, right? You had to meet your barista. You know, it's like, damn, Juliana, why make me so bitter? <laughs> you know, then cold brew became an artist by the name Lil Brew. You know, didn't like it, it kept on getting called Lil Bro. And now he goes by Mystic Brew, you know. <laughs> At any rate, whoever cares, y'all can check out the single he's been pushing for 11 months. I'm still bitter. You know, I used to work as a mover for a little bit. A guy approached me on the job one day telling me Joe Biden is the Antichrist. You know, probably approached me like, oh, he's a young person that wants to hear my wisdom. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> he also told me that Obama was a homosexual, but, you know, I simply doubt that he can be the first gay and first black president at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> That's just too progressive, you know. You know, you have the presidential dean be like, all right, you can be gay. Or you can be black. You cannot be both. Like. Okay, I have a friend named Phineas. You know, he's not fruity per se, but had these red and white New Balances. He identified as a peppermint. <laughs> you know, the pronouns aren't he or she, the Hershey's. 
<laughs> Hershey's a barter too, you know, he paper baited that term. The blender, okay. Now, I actually really like animals a lot when I was a kid. You know, I'm in my room tearing up about how the rhino was in danger, you know. <laughs> Quite empathetic. <laughs> if I ran over a squirrel last year, I felt nothing. <laughs> you know, that's, you know, that's gross. You know, I didn't, you know, I didn't grow to be, I, I'm going to be all right, you know. You know, I'm just happy that I can change a tire. And I'm not changing the world, I'm changing what's right above it. <laughs> You know, there are probably more McDonald's than there are banana trees. You know, think about it. Like, imagine being a banana tree. Like, for millennia, you have seniority up your, your real estate. And then all of a sudden, some <laughs> mixed wing of Donald comes in and ruins everything. Probably make a mixed banana next week and just to mock them. All right, this is a plantain crowd, okay? <laughs> you know, you ever seen someone so pregnant, you, you thought about making the hashtag free the embryo? <laughs> you know, I'm a twin, right? You know, at the time, you know, her and I spent the womb together. It wasn't all bad, as I recall. <laughs> you know, it was more like being in the foxhole for nine months. Except in the foxhole, you know, the big deal was a grenade and stuff, you know. You know, for us, the big deal was um, caffeine and undercooked meat. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I want to leave on a good note, but I can't sing. So I'm going to end off on a true short story. I had a math teacher. In front of the whole class, and we changed law jokes to Muhammad jokes. You know, I wish I told her, all right, Miss Little Nobody, you need to change your career to a sketch writer, because that was pretty funny. That was good. I gotta give it to you. Funny is funny. All right, y'all been fun. Thank Woo! <laughs> We're kindred spirits, kindred voices. Second Saturday of the month, Poetry Open Mic. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, all you amazing open mic <laughs> Bring us home, Sicily. Okay. Well, thank y'all all for coming out. I'm super excited. Y'all can come out every second Saturday if you want to. Tell somebody. Let them know we are here and that we want to stay here. So if you want to shop, you can shop. If you want to donate, you can donate. If you want to bid, you can bid. You can network, but we got to get up out of here in about 15 minutes. <laughs> All right. Thank y'all. Get a candle. Get a book. <laughs>